First Kings chapter 21, one verse. First Kings chapter 21, verse 25. But there was none like Ahab who sold himself to do wickedness in the sight of the Lord. He sold himself to do wickedness in the sight of the Lord. Notice the rest of the verse. Because Jezebel, his wife, stirred him up. Because Jezebel, his wife, stirred him up. Come on, I want all the men to say Jezebel, the wife, stirred him up. Uh, you're a little nervous, I see. Okay. Wives, would you help these husbands out? All the women say Jezebel. Jezebel. Wow. Come on, say Jezebel. Jezebel. His wife Jezebel. stirred Jezebel. him up. Now, everybody, let's do that together. Come on, say Jezebel. Jezebel. The wife of Ahab. She stirred Jezebel. him up. I want to talk for the next 15, maybe 20 minutes from the subject titled Defeating the Spirit of Jezebel in the Family. Defeating. I didn't say dealing, right? We're certainly not dancing. But our goal this morning is to defeat, defeat the spirit of Jezebel in the family. Would you look at your neighbor, all right? Now, don't call him Jezebel because I don't believe there's no Jezebels in the house right now, right? But come on, say today we're going to defeat the spirit of Jezebel in the family. Come on, take your seats in the presence of the Lord. Amen and amen. Take your seats if you can in the presence of the Lord. I, don't, I won't have a lot of time to really go deep into the, the, the review of last week, but we have so many new people here today, and we have those that are watching online. I think it'd be very important to try to draw a bridge from last week's topic and last week's subject to this week's subject, all right? Now, listen, I won't be long today, I promise you. I, I, of all people, would love to go have a little bite, take a little nap, and be back in the house of the Lord. Because what's important to me is that we're hearing what God is saying now. There's so many voices in the land, so many voices online, voices on the job. There are voices at the beauty shop, at the barber shop. Everybody got an opinion. Everybody got a comment. But what is God saying? What is the Lord saying now, do you understand that? And so as we look at where our country is, when we look at the state of the church, may I just be very particular today, when we look at the state of the black church, question begs to mind, where is the family? So this morning we continue this three-part series um, addressing the many challenges of manhood in 2024 and beyond. Just see a show of hands, all the men in the house, all the men in the house. All right. Now, we, 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 we look not only at the many challenges and the obstacles of men, understand, but we want to provide some solutions today because there's no, pro there's no need to talk about the problems and the challenges and the issues if we don't close out with some practical, biblical solutions uh, to be better men, right? So all that being said, we want to look at godly, biblical solutions <clears throat> for men. What kind of men? Real men. What kind of men? Strong men. Godly men. Men who are striving uh, to be better and what God has called them to be and to fulfill God's plan for their lives. Now, all that being said, next Sunday, we'll close out this series. Now, we're focusing on, we're focusing on the men, but we're going to transition just for about a week or two I want to talk about couples, whether you're engaged, whether you're married, whether you think about getting divorced or you're trying to hang in there or remarrying. Oh, man, was it Thursday night? No. You, listen, let me tell you this real quick. Last Sunday morning, you should have saw the looks on the faces of the older single men in the church when I told them it's time for y'all to love again. Most of them didn't come back to church this, morning, this Sunday morning, I see. I, I, I see they didn't like what I said, right? But you get all that. I'm not going to look that way. You get all that money. You get all that house. You get all them cars. Uh -huh. You still got some strength in, in areas of your life. Uh, why would you not uh, make some beautiful lady uh, happy as your wife? Hello? Uh-huh, uh-huh, I see. Oh, it's going to be hard work today, I see. Okay, okay, let me get back on target. Uh, <laughs> so all that being said, next Sunday, I'm going to close out this series. And I'm gonna ask, I'm gonna, I want to minister from the title that God asked in Genesis 3 and 9. Adam, where art thou? Adam, where art thou? And I want to talk next Sunday about literally seeing the best in every man. Seeing the best 
and every man. Oftentimes, men come to church and they get beat down. You ain't no good in this. You ain't no good in that. You lazy. You this. You that. No, we want to have a culture where we affirm men. No matter where you're at in the pecking order of life, we want men to be at their very best. But in order for that man to be at his best, you got to go back to Genesis 3 and try to figure out what was going on with Adam and how come he was hiding behind the excuses of his wife Eve. That's a whole other message. Next Sunday, get ready. It's going to be powerful. It's going to be epic. You'll enjoy the word of God. And so on last week, as I mentioned, there's an all-out attack and there's an all-out war waged against God's original design for the family unit. When I, use, when I say God's plan or God's design, look at it as construct, a, a construct. God's original biblical plan for family, for family, was that there'd be one male and one female. Used to be a time in the sanctified church, folk would say amen. But I understand you, may want, you don't want to be canceled cultured and you don't want nobody to look at you sideways. But used to be a time in the Bible, right, there was God's plan for a, the original design of family. One husband, one wife. Okay? Now, I do realize that there's some spaces in the world where there's one husband and multiple wives, depending on how much money you got. But we don't live in that country, right? Come on, say one husband and say one wife. Uh, uh, help me out. One male and one female. Is that right? Does anybody know what the purpose of husband and wife coming together in God's eye was for? Wasn't to make money. Uh -uh, that's not what the Bible says. Wasn't to be a build a house. That's what the Bible said. It was to do what? Produce godly offspring. That was God's plan. We, we live now in 2024, going into 2025, and it seems as if the unit of the family that is being deteriorated or destroyed, or let me use the word deconstructed, is the family. And it starts with the man. It starts with the man as husband and as father. Unfortunately, it begins with self-destruction. Before we can blame the man, and before we can blame the government, and before we can blame anybody else, we give ourselves to drugs, to alcohol, to promis promiscuity living. We give ourselves to things that are not biblical nor godly. It starts with self-destruction. We kill each other. We kill ourselves. And if that wasn't enough in the deconstruction of the family, there is, I believe, a systematic institutional campaign to keep men and women from marrying in our country. The government, uh, the, the, the incentive for a black woman to stay single is financially more prosperous than it is for her to get married to a man. Do you understand? Uh, there's this ongoing campaign, agendas of homosexuality and abortion and whatever it takes to bring down the unit. Now, you, you may not like what I'm saying, but again, th there's going to be some good news in a moment because it impacts nobody's community greater than our community. If you love Jesus and you read the Bible, say amen. amen. Right? And so we have to address the sanctity. We have to address the preservation of God's family expectation. Oh boy. I didn't think the church that I pastored would be so quiet when you heard stuff like this. I expect other churches to sit up there and not be sure what to say, yeah, and they depend on who's sitting next to you. But I'm giving you the Bible. I'm giving you scripture. I might as well add a third one to all of this. Uh, there is the effeminizing of men, the effeminizing of men in the church, in community. So now we can't tell if you're wearing men's clothes or women's clothes. <clears throat> now your makeup looks better than your wife's makeup. You smell more sweeter than your wife smells, right? Uh, oh boy, there is this ongoing subliminal feminizing of the masculine soul, even in the church. We have our crusades and conferences where we want all the men to just cry on each other's shoulder. Men don't cry on each other's shoulders. Women cry on each other's shoulders, but men, we, we, that's just not our DNA. But everybody, every man has a feminine side to him. That sounds political, it sounds good, but every man doesn't have a femininity side to them. We were called to be men. And inside the man, you're still not saying amen. You know what, the more you get quiet, I think the harder I'm gonna go today. Now. 
The Bible says, 1 Corinthians 2, 11, how will we know the, 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 the spirit of a man except the spirit, or how do we know the things of a man except the spirit of the man in the man? Paul saw something that God created in the spirit of a man. Every man has a male masculine spirit. I do understand. Unfortunately, sometimes we're raised in environments where there's more of a women's influence than a man's influence. But ladies, you can help with that. Teach your young men to be young boys. Teach those young boys. Allow them to go to mentoring programs, sports programs, team programs. I understand old boy walked out on you and you mad at him, but don't take it out on the son. Do you understand? All right, I'm just, I'm testing the waters, by the way. I'm just testing the waters, see how far we're going to go with this message, all right? Now, 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 let's, let's get on target here. So last Sunday, we looked at Ezekiel 22, 30. It says this, so I sought for a man among them who would make a wall and stand in the gap before me on the behalf of the land. Now notice, God said, I sought for the man. I'm looking for men who will stand in the gap. Men who will stand on my behalf in the land. But the Bible says, I found none. I found none. And I find it interesting that some of the same happenings in Ezekiel 22 then are some of the same happenings now. How do we know? Well, the Bible says in Ezekiel 22 that there were leaders who could not distinguish between holy and unholy. They could not distinguish what was clean and unclean. Isn't it interesting in this 2024 season? how much now we're calling right wrong and we're calling wrong right and if you do stand for what is right you are now homophobic or you are insensitive or you are a bigot or you are a bully all because you are declaring what thus saith the Lord now I understand about people I've written the books I've done the interviews I've been there done that that we speak the truth in love I had someone call me the other day he said Pastor Stephen he's not a member of the church in fact he, I don't even think he loves well I think self-admitted, self-admittedly, he's not saved. He, he'll tell you in a heartbeat, I don't know about all that just yet. But we, we're, 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 we have a relationship, and he were friends. He said, Pastor Stephen, I'm confused about something. I read one of your books, and it talked about homosexuality, and it sounds like to me you were welcoming and accepting homosexuals as they are, and they should, they should be in the church. I said, whoa, whoa, whoa. I said, time out. First of all, I'm honored that you read the book, first of all. Let me know you did your homework. I appreciate that. But there's a fine line between the word welcoming and accepting, Right? I believe the church should welcome any and everybody, no matter their background, right? No matter their background, because some of their sins are publicly seen and some sins are private. But we're all here. Now, if your neighbor not saying amen, tell your neighbor, neighbor, I'm nervous right now because you ain't said nothing the whole time he's been preaching. Go ahead and talk to him and say, neighbor, we're all here. Everybody got something in their life they ain't proud about. And if you ain't got it right now, you didn't have something back in your life before that you ain't proud about. But I was telling this, this colleague of mine, I said, listen, if the church beats down and condemns and shames men and women who are struggling in their sexuality, how are they ever going to get healed? How will they ever get ministered to? So the church, come on, say the church. The church should be a welcoming oasis. We should be a welcoming place. But in that welcome there's a standard, there's an expectation, and there's a pathway to holiness. There's a journey to righteousness, and it ain't going to happen overnight. It's not going to happen in two weeks. Uh, for some of us, it's going to take a lifetime. You're saved, but you're still being saved, and you shall be saved. We want a church, and let me just talk to the young adults while I'm here today. <laughs> We want a church, young adults, if you, I mean, we want to talk, talk about it, where people can belong before they believe and they behave. Oh, <laughs> not everybody said amen, I see. Uh, let me know, you should stop right there and pause. Most church climates is an atmosphere where you have to believe what we believe, then you better behave like we behave, then we'll allow you to join and belong. Now, that might have worked back in the 1800s, in the 1900s, early, but that ain't working now because we've not built trust. The currency today in the church is called trust. Can I trust you with my proclivities? Can I trust you with my vulnerabilities? Can I even trust you with my tears? 
So we want to have a place where no matter what your background is, no matter how you were raised in the church, outside the church, confused, doesn't matter. But we want you to know you can trust us. We're not going to out you. We're certainly not going to make matters worse. But we're going to love you, minister you, and give you the word of God. Because when a person truly feels like they belong, now you can teach them what to believe. Our problem, particularly in the Pentecostal church, has been this. We try to catch the fish, or we try to scale the fish before we catch the fish. That ain't working no more. You know what happens? They'll go right across the street to somebody else's church, as weird or as wacky or as sinful as they are, and somebody will make them feel special and welcome with the intent of teaching them the Bible. Because now that you know how to believe, you'll learn how to behave. I'm off, I'm off my target, but I, I, I think we're, I, you're a Bible-reading church and you're a Bible-believing church. Let me use some scripture. Go to Acts chapter 2. I, I hadn't planned on doing this, but I told you this morning, with such a flow of the, of the Lord in the house, we subject just to go wherever the Holy Ghost wants us to go today, all right? Real quick, come on, Acts chapter 2, Acts 2. I'm going to give you one scripture, and it's going to nail the argument for you. Acts 2, and then... Uh, well, I'm going to give you three scriptures. Verse 44. Now, all who were together, Acts 2, 44. Acts 2, 44. Now, all who believed were together and had all things in common. They sold the possessions and goods, divided among them all as anyone had need. Continually, daily, with one accord in the church, in the temple. They broke their bread from house to house. They ate the food with gladness of heart. Look at verse 47, everybody. Verse 47. Praising God and having favor with all the people. Uh, what does the next verse say? And the Lord added to the church daily who? Those who what? Who what? Those who were what? Those who were being saved. The Lord didn't add to the church those who were already saved. He didn't add to the church somebody who clicked their heels, waved the baton, gave an offering, and got baptized, and Presto was saved forever. He added to the church every day those who were in the ongoing, continuing process of progressively being saved. How does that look today? When you got saved and joined the church, you wasn't perfect. You didn't become an instant, um, cleansed, holy, righteous, no more sin person in your life. Uh, there were still some areas he's saving in you. You may have gotten saved from some things publicly, but there's some private stuff he's still saving you on. I don't know why nobody would. Right? So who are we? to tell the next generation, you better look like us, believe like us before you can belong to us. We have lost that trust. We've lost that privilege. So we have to get back. I'm gonna try to do this real quick because I've already spent half my time deviating on this morning. <sighs> How can we do this? Tell you what, I'm gonna skip the rest of the review. We closed out last Sunday by basically saying this, God's looking for men that will pray, that will live holy, that will read their Bibles, that will keep the Sabbath day holy, and men that will last. You can go online, go to YouTube, you can go on the Facebook app, and you can see the message from last week. Let's go to 1 Kings 21, all right? I just knocked out 20 minutes just by jumping ahead of time. 1 Kings 21. What do we see in 1 Kings 21? And again, I, I want to give a clean and a very clear description of this woman named Jezebel. We've given her a bad rap. We've nailed or we put things on her that really wasn't her. But things that she did do, we're, we, did, we didn't realize it until it's too late. And so this morning, for the next, let's say, 10 minutes or so, let's look at 2 Kings 21, and let's see what the Bible says about this woman named, a, uh, named Jezebel. Uh, but there was no one like Ahab who sold himself to do wicked in the sight of the Lord because Jezebel, his wife, stirred him up. Let me read that one last time, but I want to read it out of the New Living Translation. Everybody with me so far? Everybody good? New Living Translation. Uh, real quick, go ahead and put your elbow in your, in your neighbor just one good time. Just put that elbow and just kind of nudge and say, neighbor, wake up. Uh, the Lord wants to speak to you about some things. Okay, good. Now, now, I think we're all good now, all right? L listen closely. <laughs> no one else so completely sold himself to what was evil in the Lord's sight as Ahab did under the influence, under the influence of Jezebel. What do we know about Jezebel? Now, just for a few minutes, wipe out, hit the reset button, hit the delete button, wipe out everything you thought you knew about Jezebel. 
so we can show you scripturally and biblically what was really accredited to her. Number one, she's the wife of Ahab. We'll come back to Ahab in a moment. Two, she is a woman of great wickedness. She persuades and influences her husband to oppose the one Yahweh that there was to commit evil deeds. What do we know about Jezebel? She was considered the most wicked woman in the Bible. I think that's a wow moment right there. She's the first great instigator of persecution against the saints of God. How do we know this? How do we see that? Well, chapter 16, 1 King, she promotes Baal worship. Now, if you know anything about Baal worship, oh, don't do it, Mike. Don't do it, Mike. Don't do it, Mike. Don't do it, Mike. Don't do it. No, we don't have time to do it this morning. Okay, okay, okay. You know the scriptures in Psalm, I think it's Psalm 126, I think it is. I will lift up my eyes unto the hills from where my help comes from. But, but that ain't what the scripture says. It's a question, in fact. Will I lift my eyes unto the hills from where comes my help? No, because my help doesn't come from the hills. My help comes from the Lord. That scripture was written in the backdrop of Baal worship. Baal worship was the worshiping of Baal and goddesses and, and theorines and idols, and they went to the hills to do that. So the psalmist writes, I'm not going to lift my eyes to the hills because that's Baal worship. I will lift my eyes to the Lord beyond. Now, why is this important? Because when you understand Baal worship, oh, God, my God, when you understand Baal worship, it was multi polytheism of many, many gods. Usually when you see the word Baal, you see the word Asherah. Asherah was considered the fertility or the sex god. In, 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 in history, uh, you're a history buff, when you look at history figurines, and they found some archaeology-wise, it'd be a statue with a woman who had a whole bunch of, um, I almost said that word, God, thank you for keeping me, a whole bunch of breasts, all right? I was going to use other word. A whole bunch of breasts. But that's what a figurine looked like. Now, see, if a media guy was here today, he'd put a picture up, and all y'all be, oh, wow, I see. But, but she was considered the fertility god the multi-breasted one because that was who she was now listen you're looking at me weird like you know i'm saying something weird but that was the lay of the land the world was given to sexual immorality even in the church now what jezebel does uniquely different is she brings the bell worship inside the church inside the temple right she's a wicked woman with a wicked agenda. Now, let me, let's take a step further. Not only did she do that, but she orders the death. She puts a hit on the prophets of God, namely Nahu, and she succeeds. So to the point, she even goes after the greatest prophet we've ever known in the Old Testament. His name was Elijah. As great as Elijah was, oh God, he wanted to die. He was suicidal. Not because of the threat of Ahab, not because of the threat of some military or, 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 or royal leader, but because of a woman who had good street cred. Her credit, her word was so powerful when she said, Elijah, I will do to you to this day as I've done to others. It put old boy in a tailspin because he knew she meant what she said. This woman wasn't nothing to shake a stick at. She was somebody powerful. What else do we know about uh, Jezebel? Well, not only is she threatening the life of Elijah, but what you may not know was it wasn't about her makeup. The old sanctified preacher made it up more about her, 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 her red dress and her makeup. But, but that really wasn't her. She put makeup on one time, showed her face in the window, and we made a whole theology out of it. That wasn't the deal. The thing about Jezebel was a spirit of manipulation. A spirit of controlism. Stay with me. Stay with me now. I'm going somewhere with this. A spirit of dominance, force, and being overbearing. If I see anybody else fall asleep while I'm preaching, I'm going to go ahead and go right to the heart of the matter. <laughs> I'm having fun when I say this. But she then embodied now what a lot of criticism is for African-American women. I told you I was going to wake you up. That, that's, that's what I meant when I said I was going to wake you up. But whoever was none did, did, did just like this. What you just say? <laughs> I have some studies that come from a very nonpartisan research foundation that talks about the, the myths, excuse me, the dysfunctions in particular of the African-American family. 
I won't have time to give you all of them today. We may jump to it on Thursday night. We may jump to it next Sunday. In fact, I'll try at least give you one. There's a vicious cycle of perpetuating irresponsible black men, and they're often partnered with overprotective black women. Uh, certainly there's no one in the room, certainly no one in the house. But, but think about the Aunt Esthers and the Uncle Woodrow's. Uh, you don't want to think about Aunt, all right, think about your aunt and your uncle. Because oftentimes, and again, it's not, I'm not saying someone's at fault. That woman works hard to have what she wants. She awfully works hard to be God's woman. She really means to be a good wife. But here's some of the DNA problems we're going to have here. She's oftentimes the oldest sister of the group who's marrying a man who's the youngest man of his siblings. And if you're not careful and get some good Christian marital counseling and therapy counseling from Sister Kim or my wife or others, you are setting yourself up with an odd automatically. Because now he has been spoiled as the, uh, as the baby of the family. But you had to be mom number two of your siblings because you were the oldest sister. Now y'all two getting ready to get married. And there's going to be some problems from day one if you don't work through them up front. Because he can't afford to have a wife and a mama at the same time. And you, sister, can't afford to have a son and a husband at the same time. Y'all not liking what I'm saying. Because the reality is a man don't want to sleep with his mama. But he will go find somebody young, tight, and fine to spend some time with. Not that you mean any wrong, but in your DNA makeup, you're trying to make ends meet. But in his DNA makeup, he's still looking to be pacified. That's a whole nother message. I hope some of the elders can carry this message on in a couple of weeks when I'm on vacation. Let me get back to this real quick. I need to, I need to do this because Jezebel, she, she personally had nothing to do with sex. That would have been Delilah. But Jezebel was the influencer of manipulation and control. Let me give you an example. Let's start with the husband, Ahab. What do we know about Ahab? He was a wicked king, one of the most wicked kings of Israel. He was severely rebuked by Elijah for his wickedness. But we know Ahab of being soft, spineless, weak, limp, trifling, childish, and immature. He wanted to buy some land, right? And, they, and the deal didn't go his way. Well, he went home, put his head in his mom, I mean his wife's lap, and whined and cried. And she said, oh, baby, I understand. You my boo. I'm going to take care of this just for you. So she forges his name on a document, gives a decree, and basically puts matters in her own hand. Now, thank God for the Proverbs 31 woman, but that wouldn't have been an example of a Proverbs 31 woman. She outstepped her lane, her boundaries, and her limitations. It is something she was not called to do. It gave her power to do even more. How do we know this? Won't time, won't have time to do all of this. But uh, 2 Chronicles 22 and 2. By the way, if you're not writing, if you can't write it down, you can go on the app. All of these scriptures are on the app. The entire sermon is on the app, whether you're at Android or iPhone. But Azariah was 42 years old when he became the king. And he reigned one year uh, in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Athaliah, the granddaughter of Omri. Why is all this important? Verse 3. He also walked in the ways of the house of Ahab, for his mother advised him to do wickedly. What are you looking at real quick? So now we jump down not one but two generations, and the grandkids are just like the parents. The parents are just like their parents. Who were the ultimate parents? Jezebel and Ahab. Both Jezebel and Ahab are dead and gone, but their kids are walking in that same spirit. Their kids die, and they're gone. Now the grandkids are walking in that same spirit. Can I have six more minutes? Can I have six more minutes? May I have six more minutes? Right? Everybody okay so far? Now, I'm going to say something that some of the spiritualists may not like. I am not a proponent or a hard fan of generational curses. I, I, I really I have a problem with the construct of generational curses, especially if you say you're saved. Because when you get saved, you are redeemed from the curse of the law. Okay? Now, 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 I'm, I'm not a fan of generational curses, but I do believe in generational influences, generational habits. I do believe that if dad was a rolling stone and wherever he laid his hat was his home, if the son doesn't get saved, sanctified, and educated, right, he'll have the tendency to do the same. 
God, y'all are making me work this morning. If mama was a drunk and cussed everybody out with a cigarette hanging halfway out of her mouth, okay? If the daughter doesn't get saved, cleansed, redeemed, healed, there's a good chance. Y'all still not saying amen. All right, I, I know, I know, I know. Okay, okay. Uh, if mama got pregnant at 15 with no shame, no regard, there's a good chance if God doesn't intervene, if the church doesn't step in, her daughter will be the same. And the granddaughter. I don't call that generational curse, but I do believe that's generational habits. What we see with Athaliah and her husband and their children is what they, they were chip off the old block, just like their mama, Jezebel. Why is this message important today? Because we have a tendency to think that Old Testament scripture stayed in the confines of the Old Testament. There's an argument right now among theologians that this Jezebel is not the same as the Jezebel found in Revelation chapter 2. You do remember Revelation chapter, you remember the seven churches, the seven churches, um, the seven uh, churches, uh, I, I can't name all of them, but one was Thyatira. John the Revelator, not John the Baptist, stay with me, John the Revelator was on the island of Patmos. God gave him a vision. And in that vision, he sees these seven churches. Well, one is named, uh, you know what, let's just turn there. One was named Thyatira. What do we know about this church? And particularly, what is it, what is it that uh, John the Baptist revealed? Revelations 2.20. Revelations 2.20. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you because you allow that woman, Jezebel, who calls herself a prophet to teach and seduce. There's that influence again. There's that manipulation again. There's that control. There's that dominance again. Teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. Now, let's pause for a moment. Let's pause for a moment. There's a whole lot of similarities here. Some argue that this is not the same Jezebel in the Old Testament. Some say, well, this here is not really a person. It was just a spirit of a person. Either way it goes, look at the similarities. Notice the language, eating at that table. What do we find in 1 Kings? The Bible says that there were 400 prophets of Baal, and there were another 400 who ate at the table of Jezebel. In other words, they were under her spell, under her influence, under her manipulation. So that woman dies, and we know she dies because the Bible gives a very descriptive look on how she dies. In fact, the way she dies was only prophetic of what the Bible says she was going to die the way she died. But in the New Testament, thousands of years later, isn't it amazing? The old woman is dead, her spirit, her spirit. And if it wasn't her, it is something very similar to the point. John the Revelator said, let's put the name Jezebel on that spirit. That's how important this is what we're reading. Now, let me go back for a moment and I'll tie it up, all right? What I don't finish today, we'll have to pick up on Thursday night. Now, <sighs> Jezebel controls the son-in-law through her daughter. Athaliah is the daughter. And Jezebel has a tendency to meddle in the business of her adult children. Uh, I think you, I hope you know where I'm going, right? Parents, you cannot live your unlived life through your children, through manipulation and control. And I know it sounds like concern, and it may sound like compassion, but sometimes, if mom don't really care for the girl, she'll get to the son and continue to emphasize all of her bad areas and never talk about her good areas. And she's doing it in love, but the reality is, it's manipulation. He's a grown man. He's going to have to make some decisions. And I understand giving wisdom and counsel, but sometimes we dig too deep. Sometimes we go too far. And we may not have this accomplished with our husband, but I'm going to make sure you don't suffer the same thing I suffered when I was your age back in my 20s. So I'm going to manipulate your son-in-law or your husband through you. Ladies, oh boy, oh boy. Wives, young wives. How many, do we have any young wives who've been married less than five years? Let me just see your hands. Less than five years. All right, uh, okay. Somebody will raise their hand so she won't think I'm talking about her by herself. Anybody else under five years? All right, how about the under 10 years? Under 10 years. Anybody married under 10 years? Wives, any? Oh, boy. We got work to do. Uh, 
I don't want to go to 15, but I will. Anybody married under 15 years? Wise. Let me just see. Oh, boy. Oh, don't worry. The Holy Ghost just laid that one up for me. That was the Holy Ghost layup. I had a stat last week. I don't know if Nehemiah, if you can find it or not, but it was a chart I gave on black marriageable women in America. The number of unmarried black women in America. Right now, the African-American woman is the least most marriageable woman in the world. Not in America, in the world. When our young men make good money, they go find somebody of a different color. And the woman who looks like their mama, somehow knows that she's not good enough. We don't have that problem among Asians. You have that problem among whites. There it is. Thank you. Look, these numbers. And by the way, I love stats like this because they come from African-American resources. So nobody in this room can say, oh, that's the white man's number. That he be lying on us. Yeah. No, these are, these are two young African-Americans who went to HBCUs, and they are researchers by career. I did my homework before I put the screen up. Now, look at the numbers. Marriage statistics by race. See who's married? See who's not married? See who's divorced? Look at who's never been married. I think, show, go back to the other one. I, had, I think they had one that dealt with women more. Black marital status, black men, black women. There we go, 48%, 27%. Look at that compared to the US and uh, let's see, widow, separated, never married. I believe that you're the most beautiful women in the world. I believe that, bar none. African-American women, black women are the most beautiful women in the world. You are the most hardest working women in the world. You're the most ingenuity working. And you know what? I believe the most Holy Ghost filled saved women in the world. My question is, why is it, as men, we are intimidated? Why is it that we'd rather play with ourselves, right, than build a life and a career with a wife? All right. I'm trying to find a way to close this message. It's 1228. I want you to go home, get a nap, get some food. We're going to have a good church tonight. I cannot give you these last two pages of notes because it's too much. I don't want to rush through this. I don't want to overlook something. And you go home confused thinking I didn't say something I didn't say. We got work to do in our community. I know you don't like the way I preach at times. But you know what? I made up my mind a few weeks ago. Too bad. I'm going to preach what God gives me to preach, and I'm going to preach the Bible, whether it's popular, whether ain't nobody else doing it or not. We have to go back and focus on our marriages, on our African-American marriages. We got to go back and raise some godly African-American kids. We got to find a way to get past our differences, our complaints, our hurts, and find a way to agree on some things. I'm hoping that somebody in this church will do a study and present and preach this message for me. How do couples not grow apart as they get older? How do they stay together in their 30s and 40s and 50 years of marriage and not just be living roommates? Because when we got kids at home, we're busy. It's going to be a soccer practice, it's going to be a football practice, it's going to be a game, it's going to be rehearsals, it's going to be this, it's going to be that, blah, 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 blah. We spend those 18 years busy, 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 busy. And when they leave, now it's just two, you're at home. And you have nothing to say. How do we not grow apart? We spent our best years. We spent our strongest years raising kids without a gone. How do we stay active? And I'm not being condemned. I hope you don't hear me being condemning or hard because I, I'm, I'm happy. I'm happy to see so many of you all who are living your best lives in the latter years of your marriage. I, I, I mean that. What is it that we have to do to stay active? So let's go back to those single men and those single women in the church. You've been divorced. You, 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 you pretty much made up your mind, I ain't getting married no more. But what if, what if God wants you to get married? Well, he ain't going to do that. Uh, you better go ask... Um, who was it? A uh, Bible scholar in the Old Testament. Um, God told me to marry. Uh, what, was the, what was the prophet's name? Not Nahum. Um, Gomer was the woman, but the man was Hosea. Thank you. Thank you. What if 
God said, Hosea, I want you to go get married again. Even though your heart got broke, you're happy being single, you're a bachelor, but I want you to love again. Oh, by the way, I'm going to put you with a woman who ain't got the best background and best, best past. Now, we, we were just singing these songs, God, not my will, thy will be done. I'm available to you, all that I am, all that I'm not. Use me, Lord. You are the part, I am the clay. You're not singing songs right now, I see. Because at the end of the day, he wants to restore the sanctity of the family. And some of us, you know what? I, I, I'm trying, y'all. I'm trying to finish. I can't. Come on, let's stand to our feet. Come on, stand to our feet. I, I, I have so much more but I can't finish it all today. I really want to. Uh, I'm, I'm training a group of preachers in a couple of weeks, invite only, and three things you're gonna learn in this training. Be brief, be bold, be brilliant. Be bold, be brilliant, but be brief. One of the things Brother Wayne would tell you when we grew up under Dr. Lockett, man, he teaches with such power, such force, and such anointing. Sharon, you remember that? That in the middle of that message, he'll cut it off. and say, if you want more, come back tonight. I'll come back Thursday or come back next Sunday. And we'd be like, good Lord. You thought Batman and Robin was bad until next week? Yeah, you had to wait a whole week to watch. I want you to want what God wants. I used to say it like this. I don't, I don't say it often anymore. But Jesus said, I've not come to bring the whole hallelujah, bye bye, and everybody's seen kumbaya, sit in circles. I've come to bring a sword. And this is an hour where it seems to be division. And this is where the real saints have to stand. I'm not going to be able to finish this message today. I had three words, choose, choice, excuse me, choose, change, and commit. Choose, change, commit. You're going to have to make a choice, brother. You're going to have to make a choice who you're going to serve. Because you can't serve Baal and serve God at the same time. Right? You, you, you're not going to be able to serve the gods of Jezebel, the Asherahs and the Baals of Jezebel, and still come to church and be a deacon, or a minister, or a praise team singer. You're gonna have to make some choices. There has to be change. What kind of change? Uh, I promise you I'd give a couple of these, but five dysfunctions of the African-American family, disrespect, words of mutual content, ridicule, mistrust as mates. Number two, disproportionate rates of physical, verbal, spiritual, and psychological abuse among black couples. I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but we don't do well in these areas because of the content. The number one killer of black women ages 15 to 34, it's not cancer, it's not a car wreck, it's the black man. And you say, well, we, we in the church, we in the church. Church folk go through stuff too. May not be as lethal. But we go through stuff too. Problem is, we come to church with Sunday's finest on, and you never see it. Most men fail privately before they fall publicly. Only a fair, fair few people will ever be exposed publicly at a certain level. But at the tip of that iceberg is a mountain of men that struggle at home. I'm trying to stay focused at this part of the message because there's a part of me that comes up that says, how come you can't come to prayer? May I pastor? May I pastor just for a few moments? How come you can never come to a brother's fellowship? You got time for sports. You got time for politics. You got time to sh just shoot the breeze. But you, you can never come to Thursday night service. You, you never come to the couples fellowship. You know, we have a good time at the couples fellowship. We have a wonderful, and it's a well balanced. Sometimes it's Bible study and it's reading and prayer. Other times it's playing spades and doing stupid stuff. <laughs> but we have fun. But as a couple, you never come. But then I'll get a text, or my wife gets a text. We can't share with everybody, no. But we're sitting here with this conundrum saying, good God. You, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. But when the bottom falls out and life hits you in the mouth, and what we're trying to say is this, stay in prayer. 
Stay in the word. Stay in fellowship. Do you understand that? Stay together. Be open. Be honest. Be transparent. You ain't the only one going through the rocks. You ain't the only one who wanted to pack your bag. We all done been there. But again, the church teaches us. We're holy. We're sanctified. We're spirit-filled. We never have any problem. You are lying. I'm glad I'm saying because there was another word that you could have kind of slid. You know, you're not listening to Pat. You do when you get upset at people. Y'all just, <laughs> all right, anyway. <laughs> Jezebel, and I'm going to say this and I'm finished. I'm going to say this and I'm finished. When a man chooses, he makes a change. Wow. I might as well give you the other two or three since I'm on it. Another dysfunction of the marriage in African American community is the acceptance and the expectations of infidelity. It is just a thing that's going to happen in our community. There's no even try. Cha, he going to cheat. Cha, he going to cheat. Well, it used to be there was a he, now it's a she. Because you have more women, not more she. You have just as many men and women as men who commit infidelity in their marriages. And brother, when you break that girl's heart, it's a, it's a tough road to hold to get back to where you need to be being restored. There's a spirit of Jezebel that looms around the families. Manipulation, control, a dominance. Number five, number four, emotional shutdown and distance that fosters unhealthy relationships resulting in loss of intimacy. It's hard to sleep and make love to a person you're not even friends with anymore. I'm talking about wife and husband right now. I'm not talking about boyfriend and girlfriend. I ain't talking about fiancés. That's called fornication. Used to be a time when preacher would say that, folk would say amen. That's called fornication. And that's not pleasing to the Lord. Number five, the vicious cycle of perpetuating irresponsible black men and protective black women. My sisters, I want you to be aware of this. I want you to be aware of this. Because in the book of Revelations 2, that spirit ran through the church and it hit some of the best of the church leaders. And the rebuke from John to Thyatira was, how is it no one will preach on this stuff? Why is that you allow this spirit to fester in the church? Go back and read, just read. You allow that woman Jezebel to stay in the midst of the praise team, in the midst of the deacons department, in the midst of the women's group. And you know what? That's not even gender specific. It can be in the men's group. So here's what we're going to do. I promise you that I would never give you the problem. I'll give you some solutions. There are four unique things. Just stand right there. Stand right there and listen. Just stand right there and hear this. You got to go home and recommit to building a solid biblical family. Spend time with each other, talking, touch, time. Minister, learn how to forgive. Learn how to forgive. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, oh God, I'm sorry. I've sinned. I was wrong. Forgive me. Let's get some help. Let's find somebody who can mentor us and we can be better. My brother, let's get up with another man who can walk with you confidentially and not put your business out there in the street. Number two, how do we get some help? Having and honoring the unique and exclusive roles and responsibilities. There are exclusive and unique roles that the husband and wife have, that the man and the woman have. Number three, knowing the strength and the achievement of working hard. There's not a, there, there should not be one man in this room who doesn't have value and pride in being a hard worker. This is something about it when you have put a good, hard day work in. And guess what? That woman will enjoy that. You bringing the bacon home, she can pay the bills. You may smell like a billy goat, but I'm telling you right now, there's a badge of honor knowing I've worked my behind off today to provide for my family. Now go take your bath and come on in here so we can talk. Now, number four, finally, you got to keep, you got to put, and you got to keep God first. Everything you've heard today is in vain if God is not first in your life. 
okay? He cannot be second. He can't be third. He can't be when you get around to it. You kind of add him into your daily and weekly calendar. He has to be first. Heads about eyes are closed. Heads about eyes are closed. I've rushed through this, um, and I kind of feel a little bad that I've rushed through this message. Uh, I love statistics. I love numbers. I love facts. I got my bachelor's degree in political science, and a lot of that had to do with research. And so when I hear numbers and I hear facts, particularly from credible resources, it adds value to that which we walk by faith. And some of the facts simply are this. It is known that religion, church, fosters better welfare for people, economically, emotionally, adults and children. Church attendance improves family strength, marriage, recovery from trauma. The lack of church is equal oftentimes to increased drug abuse crime, suicide, depression, poverty, alcoholism. But we didn't need those numbers to confirm what we already knew. Matthew 6, said it best, but seek ye first the kingdom of heaven and all of his righteousness and all these things will come to pass. Thank you for watching Dr. Michael A. Stevens at City Church Northlake. Please like, share, and subscribe to our channel for more encouraging and inspiring messages.